On now. Okay, good. I had the microphone turned off, sorry. Yeah, how many of you recognize this uh, beach? It's the one and only green sand beach that you'll find. Yeah, it's in Hawaii, very near the south point of the big island of Hawaii, also known as Papa Kaleo Beach. It's a green sand beach, and if you were to go back far in time on planet Earth, all the beaches were green sand beaches, but this is the only one we have, and the reason why is that the Hawaiian Islands sit on top of a hot plume, which means you get hot magma material from deep in the interior earth welling up, and that's what's making the Hawaiian Islands. And so this is from a recent volcanic eruption uh, where they had uh, the spilling out of lava that came from very deep uh, below the crust of the earth. And uh, this shows you uh, what the sand actually looks like. A uh, little small uh, transparent uh, green grains and uh, the green color comes from a mineral that you find deep in the mantle of the earth, olivine. Now, olivine is quite rare on the, on the surface of the earth, but as I mentioned, there was a time uh, when this olivine uh, sand was ubiquitous over the uh, uh, beaches of the earth. And that would have been a problem if we have a lot of this uh, today, because uh, this mineral is a property that is very oxygen hungry. It soaks up oxygen like crazy. Uh, but if you were to go back uh, 3.8 billion years, this was kind of the mineral that was predominant on the continental land masses of the Earth, which at that time uh, were quite a bit smaller than they are today. And uh, the soaking up of all that oxygen allowed methane to become a significant gas in Earth's atmosphere. If you've got lots of oxygen, it basically destroys the methane. And so yeah, when methane is expelled in our atmosphere, uh, oxygen uh, knocks it out uh, quite quickly. But methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, much more powerful than water vapor or carbon dioxide. And so with all of this olivine on the face of the earth, it soaked up the oxygen that methane could actually remain in Earth's atmosphere. Now that was important because at that time, uh, the sun was about 23% dimmer than it is today. And with such a dim sun, uh, that would have made the planet frozen unless there was enough methane gas to keep the planet warm enough that it wouldn't freeze. But the new discovery that's been published in the scientific literature is that they've now been able to date through isotope measurements the transition of the continents of the Earth from green sand to gray or brown sand. So this is what it looked like uh, three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, and this is what sand looks like today. Uh, and this, is, this kind of sand we see today is dominated by silica, basically silicon dioxide, as opposed to this magnesium-rich uh, olivine sand that we see in the past. So no longer today do we have uh, sand that soaks up copious quantities of oxygen. Uh, we only have that one small beach, that's it, so it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, but this transition uh, from green sand to gray and brown sand was perfectly timed uh, given the brightening of the sun. So this is how the sun's luminosity changes over the history of the sun. Uh, when it's accumulating masses of forms, it literally doubles in brightness and then it dims as it begins to lose mass during its early youth, uh, but once it stops losing mass and ignites nuclear fusion in its core, uh, that's where in the furnace of the sun, you get the fusion of hydrogen into helium and the release of a lot of heat and light. Uh, but as that fusion continues, uh, we see the ratio of helium to hydrogen increase over time, and an increase causes the nuclear furnace to burn ever more efficiently. So the sun today is about 23% brighter than it was uh, at the time our planet was dominated by these olivine uh, sand grains. And, uh, you know, but thankfully, this event took place uh, between three and three and a half billion years ago, and that's actually the perfect date if you want the possible future existence of human beings. So for example, if that event and transition 
from magnesium dominated sands to silicon dominated sands uh, had happened any earlier, Earth would have become a permanent ice ball and no life would have remained on the planet uh, for the last three billion years. On the other hand, if it happened a little bit later, uh, then all of the Earth's water would have been turned into steam and uh, the planet would have become so hot that no life would be possible. So it's perfectly timed to have a long history of life uh, that could end up with human beings entering the cosmic scene. So that just did get uh, published and I do believe it will hit the internet, uh, but you're getting the first news right here. And it demonstrates the principle that we've been documenting it reasons to believe that the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we have for the supernatural handiwork of God. And the two evidences here is the timing is perfect and also the quantity of the silica-based sand uh, compared to uh, olivine-based uh, sand. Uh, that quantity ratio likewise must be fine-tuned in order to have 3.8 billion years of life history on planet Earth. So we got people at the microphone, so I'm going to stop talking. And uh, as long as there's people there, you won't hear from me. So uh, I'm talking about new discoveries, but go ahead. We also, we also you have a text question already, so I'm going to let John go, and then we'll do a question coming in over the phone. And before we go to John, this is actually the oxygenation history of the Earth. And so oxygen was kept very low because of this olivine sand, and it bumped up and at just the right time it came up to make animals possible and finally human beings. But go ahead, John. Uh, the subject matter is the migration of early man. Now, we know that uh, the Garden of Eden is the starting point in the Bible for modern men. And that undoubtedly is, uh, the location of that is under the Persian Gulf. Have we, as we've talked about before. However, uh, in accordance with uh, paleontology, uh, the uh, most early settlements of modern man are in Africa. And I believe I read a recent discovery where the migration out of Africa was earlier than they thought. It was about 60,000 years ago. I think it was in Saudi Arabia they found uh, uh, some evidence of that. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And so the question is, uh, please discuss RTB's model about the relationship of uh, the Garden of Eden to Africa and the earliest uh, indications of modern man that we currently have in Africa and the migration uh, with this new evidence and so on. So, like to have an overall uh, picture of how you view that. Thank sure. you. Sure. And if you want a detailed answer, you'll find it in my book, Navigating Genesis, but I'll try to give a brief answer uh, to your question. And uh, you are right that uh, what you see in Genesis 2 uh, is the Garden of Eden being located in what is now the southeastern portion of the Persian Gulf. You get that because the text talks about four known rivers coming together and the only location where they come together today is about 250 feet uh, below sea level. But during the last ice age, it was about 100 feet above sea level. And so that's why I believe that the Garden of Eden event happened sometime during the last ice age. And so that would put a date on God creating Adam and Eve at somewhere between say 20,000 and 130,000 years ago. Uh, now you're referring to dates about finding uh, evidence for early human activity in Eastern Africa as well as Arabia. Uh, those dates are not radiometric dates and so uh, what I pointed out in both our book Who is Adam and Navigating Genesis, the best scientific date when you take into account both the random and systematic errors is 150,000 years ago plus or minus 150,000 years. So. <laughs> The problem with trying to date uh, human origins scientifically, we, we lack an objective uh, dating method that has high precision. Now, if we're talking something in the neighborhood of, say, 40,000 years ago or less, you can use carbon-14 dating. 
if you're talking something more than a million years, you've got radiometric dates. But there's this gray zone where we don't have a good scientific dating uh, method. Well, the error bars, I mean, typically when you read the scientific literature, they only give you the random error bars. Uh, they don't give you the systematic error bars, mainly because in many cases, they're not even sure what the systematics are. And uh, what I mean by systematics are assumptions that could push the date to one side or to the other. Random errors talk about how accurate the measurement is, but the systematics tell you that uh, there may be uh, assumption laden uh, that could actually push the measurement one way to the other. And the, the systematic errors are always much bigger than the random errors we talk about dating human remains. So that's just a caveat on all the dates that are out there. But what you will see in the scientific literature in terms of uh, dating the earliest undisputed evidence for human activity, it clusters in East Africa, Arabia, and the Persian Gulf. And so what I mentioned in Navigating Genesis, there are three periods during the last ice age where you've got an easy, rapid migration route from the Persian Gulf into Africa. And keep in mind, during the last ice age, there is a land bridge joining Arabia to Eastern Africa. So people wouldn't have to cross any water. Um, and there were three periods uh, when there was a lush valley going through what is now called the uh, uh, empty quarter. In fact, uh, let me pull this back up here for you. Uh, this is actually taken in the empty quarter. The empty quarter refers to the bottom third of Arabia, and the whole bottom third looks like that today. Uh, but there were three times during the last ice age uh, where the Gihon River flowed uh, through the southern part of Arabia, and that would have allowed an easy migration route uh, from Africa into the Persian Gulf and from the Persian Gulf into Africa. Uh, I'm trying to remember the dates, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing at this point, but I think the earliest date is like 115 to 117,000 years ago when that easy migration route was in place. Another one is like 77 to 78,000 years ago, and another one is around 45,000 years ago. So you can take your pick. Uh, that's kind of the status uh, for the best evidence we have for the location and the dates uh, for human origins. And uh, as far as what we can look for in the future, I don't have a lot of hope that we're going to get better data. Uh, we just lack the tools that we need to get that better data. Uh, although I, what I think will happen is that we will eventually find evidence for early metallurgy. I mean, the assumption was that you didn't have metallurgy uh, or sophisticated agriculture until 12,000 years ago. But they've now found evidence at 23,000 years and 36,000 years ago uh, that humans were actually engaged in farming, harvesting grains, roasting the grains, grinding the grains, and making bakery products, all on a very small scale because of how uh, uh, highly variable the global mean temperature was. But likewise, I think we will eventually find evidence for metallurgy that dates that early. But likewise, it's going to be on a very small scale, which explains why it hasn't been discovered yet. At least part of the population was uh, localized to the Garden of Eden at that time. Uh, Oh, the mic wasn't on. Uh, <clears throat> repeat the question. Yeah, you need to be a little closer to that microphone. Okay. Uh, at the time of uh, Cain and Abel, and where Cain went off to another city, uh, it would be a reasonable assumption that at least part of the population at that time was still local uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf area. Uh, and maybe a portion of it siphoned off and migrated. Uh, that's a possibility. What would be the motive for migrating to Arabia and then East Africa? What would be their motive for going down there? Was it a really lush, uh, 
paradise down there at that time? Or well, you made reference to Genesis 4 and how Cain uh, left the Garden of Eden locale and went to the land of Nod. And please, none of you, don't go to the land of Nod while we're doing this. Uh, <clears throat> and the land of Nod uh, was some distance. Uh, you see that implication in the text. But likewise, it was probably a place where uh, you had relatively uh, lush vegetation. And uh, likewise, I would think whenever you've got uh, migration routes that have lush vegetation, you're going to see humans uh, migrating. And so today, if you're in the Persian Gulf area, there really isn't much outside that area. But there were, uh, during the last ice age, there were times when indeed that happened. And yeah, as early as Genesis 4, you've got some significant migration going on. But keep in mind, we got big error bars in terms of what the Bible says. The Bible only gives us a rough indication, doesn't exactly give us the location, just says that the land of Nod is to the east of Eden. Doesn't tell us how far. Probably somewhere in Persia. Um, and likewise, in terms of the science, uh, we don't have really specific data at this point. Here we got a question in coming in over uh, the text. This is the first time we've ever had a text in question at the Skeptics Forum, so All this right. is a big deal. And it fits right in with that question. Do you believe that an actual Adam and Eve existed? And if so, what scientific evidence do we have for their existence? How did all people groups arise from two people? Okay, well, I do believe that uh, there is an Adam and Eve, that there are two real people from whom all humanity is descended. You actually see a reference to that in the book of Acts, where it talks about how all nations come from one man uh, or one blood. Um, and in terms of scientific evidence for that, there's not scientific evidence that proves it, but for example, uh, mitochondrial Y chromosome DNA analysis is consistent with all of humanity uh, coming from one man and one woman. Uh, but a caveat is it's also consistent with all of humanity coming from a few uh, women and a few men, but it is consistent uh, with the one man, uh, one woman idea. And as far as looking at the genetic evidence today, it indeed is consistent with all humanity uh, coming from two individuals. I mean, of all life forms on planet Earth, what's remarkable about the human species, even though there's seven and a half billion of us, our DNA is remarkably uniform amongst the individuals that make up the human population. So for example, even though Neanderthals uh, were considerably less numerous, uh, we see significantly greater DNA variation and that, you know, they were around longer with much smaller population, and yet they have a greater genetic diversity. So, and I think what's interesting too is the greatest genetic diversity you see in the human population is between the Zulu blacks and the Bantu blacks that live in South Africa. So even though you've got people living close together, you can get significant diversity. In fact, Africa is a place where you see the greatest diversity. And that's one reason why people think uh, the first humans must have been in Africa because that's where you see the greatest genetic diversity. But Africa is also the place where people practiced um, marriage isolation. So for example, the reason why the Bantu and Zulu blacks have such great genetic diversity compared to one another, Bantus would never let one of their uh, sons or daughters marry a Zulu, and likewise the Zulus, and that went on literally for thousands of years. And so it basically preserved a genetic diversity that you don't see in Africa, or pardon me, in Asia or Europe. Go ahead, Al. Good morning. <clears throat> um, I have a, a question uh, that um, concerns the uh, chaos in the cosmos. Uh, evidently, they found uh, Astrologers have found astrologers? astrologers. Astronomers, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that uh, um, we were just missed by a comet or an asteroid by 115,000 miles. Yes. And they didn't know until two days later or something like that. Uh, and we know what these uh, 
comets and, and, and things and cause because of that uh, one that struck in Siberia right. in uh, 1907, I think it was, what the year I was born. Uh, and it, it devastated a huge area of, of, of uh, Siberia. So my question is, God does not keep very good track of all these things that are going on in the cosmos. Because, I mean, it's just one big explosion after another, eventually. Everything that's out there will eventually explode. And, well, that's my question. You know. Well, it's a good question, now. He's omnipotent. He's not a very and, good uh, tracker. <laughs> yeah, you'll actually see a chapter in the book Improbable Planet on uh, the solar systems, asteroid, and comet belts. And uh, it's fairly new evidence that we have because for the first time we can actually detect. You can't hear? Okay. It's okay? All right. Um, for the first time, we astronomers are actually to detect asteroid and comet belts around other uh, planetary systems. And we notice is the vast majority have no comets or asteroids at all, about 90%. About 10% have asteroid and comet belts a thousand times bigger than the ones we see orbiting the sun. And we actually now understand why this happens. Because most of the planetary systems we see is where the gas giants have migrated in towards their host stars to inside the orbit of the Earth. And when that happens, uh, those gas giant planets scatter out all the comets and asteroids. And most of the planetary systems we observe, we, we observe have that characteristic. They got gas giant planets orbiting close to their host stars. And so they have no asteroids or comets. The other 10%, the, uh, the gas giants don't migrate at all. So they basically remain where they formed and they have enormous asteroid and comet belts, literally thousands of times bigger than we see. What's unique about our solar system is that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune migrated towards the sun. Jupiter got the closest, but it stopped at about uh, the orbit of Mars, and then it reversed and migrated back out. And so that moving in towards and stopping at about the orbit of Mars and moving back out cause 99 point whatever percent of the comet and asteroid belts to be scattered. But five small asteroid and comet belts remained. And this is the only planetary system we see that's got small asteroid and comet belts. And we now recognize that's crucial uh, for human civilization. Because if you have no asteroids and comets at all, then you've got no source to replenish the very slow leakage of water from the Earth. Now water, you know, Earth's gravity is pretty good at hanging on to its water, uh, but not totally. And if it had enough gravity to hang on to its water without losing any, we'd also be hanging on to a lot of other gases that would be bad for human civilization. And so the Earth's gravity is fine-tuned, but there is a small loss of water. But the water we lose is replaced by the comets that impact the Earth. Comets are 85% frozen water. So the water we lose gets perfectly replaced by the water we gain. Uh, but you're right, sometimes we get hit by something quite big. And uh, so if you go back 66 million years ago, uh, there was a six mile diameter asteroid that smashed into the Earth and wiped out all the big animals, including all the dinosaurs. But we humans actually gain some benefits uh, from these big collision events. So for example, over half of the nickel that's in circulation in human civilization comes from an asteroid collision site, Sudbury, Ontario. That's where an asteroid hit, and it was uh, you know, a very rich, a nickel-rich asteroid. And that's been a real benefit for our civilization. 80% of the gold that's in circulation in human civilization and 80% of the platinum uh, comes from an asteroid collision site in South Africa. So we actually have some benefits uh, from getting occasional hits uh, from these asteroids. However, you don't want that happening every day. I mean, 
Uh, you know, that was, I mean, if we had big asteroid and comet belts, then we would be impacted so frequently you couldn't build cities. Uh, but events of that nature happen only about every 30 to 35 million years. And so uh, it's actually possible to have a narrow time window in which we got human civilization. I'll give you another statistic. Have you ever seen that um, meteor collision site in Arizona, the Winslow Crater site? Uh, an event like that happens about once every 10,000 years. And the energy release is roughly equivalent to the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So, but again, that's only once every 10,000 years. Why an all-powerful God cannot control these uh, uh, chaotic events that happen that could wipe us out in any moment? And that was part of my... Yeah, well, an all-powerful God could control these collision events so that Manhattan doesn't get hit and some sandy place in Arizona gets hit instead where it only knocks out uh, a few uh, uh, rats and uh, mice and uh, rattlesnakes. I mean, that God could do that. But something I've written about in my book, Why the Universe is the Way it Is, God could intervene. And you see instances recorded in Scripture where he has intervened to save humans from natural disasters. But if he were to do that all the time, it would blunt the benefit that we gain uh, from just letting the laws of thermodynamics run. Letting the laws of thermodynamics run uh, provides a powerful restraint on the expression of human evil. And so there's a reason why God only intervenes rarely rather than all the time. Because if he did it all the time, then we humans would lack the benefit of restraint from the laws of physics that keeps us from doing too many evil deeds. As it is, God tolerates quite a bit of evil, but uh, he's got a plan to use the laws of physics and the randomness and the chaos that comes out of those laws of physics to eventually completely eliminate all evil and suffering. So he's actually using all this for good. But if you want the details, there's a whole book on it, why the universe is the way it is. Long time, probably the oldest guy in here. I've never seen him intervene. Pardon so, me, I didn't hear that. I said I've been alive a long time, probably older than anybody here, and I've never seen him intervene. Oh, he has intervened. Here's how God intervenes with the laws of physics: the more evil you commit, the more work you have to do to undo the damage of your evil, and the more pain you experience, and the more time you waste. And that's because God saw fit to put you in a universe where there's gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism. Those laws of physics guarantee that the more evil we commit, the more work we're going to have to do, the more pain we're going to experience, and the more time we're going to waste. And if you're like the rest of us, you don't like those things. And so that's actually a motivation uh, that God put, imposes on each of us. As I said to my sons when they were growing up, if I don't discipline you, the laws of physics will. <laughs> All right, we've got another question coming in from uh, the phone, but I, I want to try to take a shot at that, Al. I, I, I have a challenge for you, Al. Find 10 Christians at random, okay, people you know in the class, and ask them, how has God intervened in their life in obvious ways. And I bet you all 10 of them will give you very clear ways in which he has intervened beyond the laws of physics in their life. So that's my challenge to you. Well, let me add another one. Ask people, have you ever experienced an incident where you wanted to do evil, but you weren't able to pull it off mm. because of the phys physical situation? Very good, yeah. Okay. Here's the question. I heard somewhere that God won't heal amputees. Do you have an answer for the reason for that? Yes, I do. I get asked that question quite a bit. And uh, you actually see an incident in the Gospels where Jesus did heal an amputee. Someone had a withered hand uh, that was useless and healed it uh, so that it could be uh, fully operable. But again, God does that rarely. And, uh, he wants us to experience the benefits of the laws of physics. So, for example, notice God allows all of us to get older. As we get older, we decay. 
Um, and if you don't believe that, look around at one another, okay? <laughs> We're all in a process of uh, ever uh, progressing decay, at least those of us who are older. So, but. Okay. <laughs> so, while God could intervene, He chooses not to because He really wants us to benefit uh, from the laws of physics. And there will come a time when those laws of physics won't exist. If you read the last two chapters of the Bible, it describes a realm where there's no gravity, where there's no thermodynamics, where there's no electromagnetism, <coughs> where there's different space-time dimensions. Why? Because it's a realm where no one will ever use their free will to express evil or evil intent. And therefore, those laws are no longer needed, and those space-time dimensions are no longer needed. And that's a point where there won't be amputations, there won't be disease, uh, you won't get gray hair. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's okay, at least I've got it. Or, yeah, I mean, I don't have any, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there will come a time. And you know what it tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, that we're all experiencing physical decay, but those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, we're experiencing spiritual renewal, and the spiritual renewal far outweighs the physical decay, because the physical decay is relatively slow, but the spiritual renewal can actually happen on a daily basis. And that's what's fun about being around people who have been followers of Jesus Christ literally for decades. You can see just how much beautiful they're getting in a spiritual context, and it far outweighs any physical decay they experience. And so I encourage people, go into rest homes uh, where you've got uh, you know, believers that are experiencing significant physical mm -hmm. decay and just see how wonderful it is to be around them. Thank you, Hugh. Doug? Well, I'm, you know, I'm tempted to, I, I could speak for an hour about what God's done for me and if I got my prayer journal, I could speak for four hours. So maybe I'll talk to Al about that later. <laughs> But I have a question about uh, reasons to believe. Um, when you guys uh, go to work, do you have like little sem uh, conferences? Do you talk to Fuzrana about biology? Do you talk to a AJ Roberts about viruses and all that? That's my first question. <laughs> okay, I'll answer your first and question. That, 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 then that's it, Doug. That's your first question. That's the one question. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Get back yeah, at Reasons to Believe, we have uh, about two scholar lunches a week uh, where we debate one another and what we're doing in terms of our research and writing. And uh, those are always fun sessions. And uh, sometimes we go to a restaurant and have those dialogues and a whole lot of people listen in. Because uh, it almost seems like you're a biologist when I talk to you about biology and your expertise. Well, I pick up a lot me. just listening to my colleagues. But you know what I really enjoy about those luncheons? is the fact that uh, we challenge one another. And it's like iron sharpening iron. And so I developed some of my best stuff by being challenged by my colleagues. And on, you still uh, my read research books probably, writing. right? You know, Pardon me? You probably read a lot of books about biology and oh, other sure. fields of science? Or? Well, just go to my Facebook, especially go to my Twitter page. You'll see all the citations I'm giving yeah. to the scientific literature in many different disciplines. Incidentally, that's what we do at Reasons to Believe. We take top scholars out of academia and set them free to do interdisciplinary research. Because when I was at Caltech, I could only read the literature that was relevant to my research because the research was just so intense. I didn't have time uh, to read outside uh, my subdiscipline. In fact, things were so bad back in those days that you know, the whole astronomy department would go to a restaurant and take over the restaurant. Uh, but the ultraviolet astronomers would sit at one table, the X-ray astronomers at another table, <laughs> radio astronomers another table, and if you sat at the wrong table, you couldn't follow the conversation. That's how specialized science has become in the 21st century. Okay, thanks. Here we have a written question. How were people saved before Christ went to the cross? How were people saved before Christ went to the cross? The same way we are. Uh, it tells us in uh, Romans 1, for example, that all have uh, heard and that uh, nature reveals uh, God, his attributes. And uh, 
You know, if you look at the book of Job, uh, Job was one of the wisest and humblest of all men. But if you read that book of Job, he was actually able to declare all the basics of the gospel uh, through the Redeemer. He didn't know the name of the Redeemer, but he actually knew that God had to be the Redeemer, that God was his advocate, and there was no other way he could be delivered uh, from his propensity to commit sin and evil other than to go to his Redeemer and say, I know you're loving enough from what I see in nature, I know you're powerful enough from what I see in nature, and I know uh, that uh, uh, you're uh, knowledgeable enough from what I see in nature that you will do what I'm not able to do for myself. You will deliver me uh, from my propensity. And so he's able to say in the 19th chapter, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will see him in my flesh on the last day. So he not only knew the gospel plan, he was able to declare the assurance of his salvation, all through looking at what God had revealed in nature. Now, very few of us have the humility and the wisdom of Job. Uh, so today, God's got multiple ways of reaching us through uh, books, testimonies, the Bible, etc. But yeah, in the Old Testament, uh, everyone uh, was exposed, just like everyone is exposed today. So that's why it says, no one is an excuse. We've all seen and heard. Thank you. Peter? Yes, if, um, if I made a statement like the finest stopwatch I own can measure hundredths of a second, and that therefore time can't be split infinitely because we can't measure it so, uh, I heard a similar claim made by Vic Stinger in your debate with him at Caltech, and he claimed that since we can't measure time finer than the Planck time, that time is discrete, as he put it, in segments of the Planck time. And I took his argument to be that we really can't get to t equals zero and a singularity because of measurement of time. And I didn't hear that specifically addressed in the debate, but it seemed to me to be quite a uh, an egotistical claim that time is determined by man's measurement of it. Would you comment on that? Yeah, what Victor was, Singer was saying in that debate at Caltech is that uh, you know perhaps time is not continuous, perhaps it's quantized. And so quantum mechanics uh, might play a role in uh, the expression of time. And says so we can't you know, uh, prove that, but we can't disprove it either. We lack the measuring capacity to do it. And you know, what would it take to actually show whether or not time is quantized at that level? It would take a particle accelerator that would go from here to a galaxy 12 billion light years away. And chances are that's not going to be funded anytime soon. So <laughs> this is why you have physicists saying, well, since we can't make these measurements, we're free to speculate that maybe something really exotic is going on in the physics. And in the latest edition of The Crater in the Cosmos, I have a chapter that addresses what I call non-empirical attempts to avoid a theistic uh, worldview perspective. And I think this is what's interesting. In the 21st century, our observations, measurements, and experiments uh, overwhelmingly established that there must be a God beyond space and time that created the universe and specifically designed it for the benefit of us human beings. And it's become so overwhelming that those who take a non-theistic perspective are being forced to appeal to these non-empirical arguments, which are either cyclical arguments, uh, you know, circular reasoning, or they appeal to realms that we're not able to measure or may never be able to measure. Now, what's interesting in that uh, part of this book, as I say, we've actually been able to push the frontiers of knowledge where we actually can penetrate, to some degree, the quantum gravity era. That's that era where, quote, time might be uh, quantized. And it's by looking at the images of distant quasars and blazars. Because if there is quantization of space-time at a high level, where you've got high quantum space-time fluctuations, in the space-time fabric, uh, that would be amplified in the images of distant quasars and blazars. And so what would happen is those images would blur a little bit. And so we're able to look at those images and see if we see the blurring that would sustain the speculation 
that we've got really big quantum space-time fluctuations. And we don't see any blurriness in those images. Now, this is a merging material. It's only been around for the past year, but we've been able to make these kinds of measurements. And it's only been done in quasars and blazars at ultraviolet wavelengths that are three billion light years away. We could make the test much more definitive by looking at quasars and blazars 10, 12 billion light years away at X-ray wavelengths. That hasn't been done yet, but that would allow an even deeper penetration of the quantum gravity era. Likewise, come this December, uh, an array of radio telescopes that stretches around the planet and actually gives us a telescope power of a telescope with a diameter of 6,000 miles. Uh, they're gonna, that instrument is being used right now to image the event horizon of the black hole, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And that image will actually give us some information on what's happening in the quantum gravity here. And if we're lucky enough to find a neutron star in a close orbit uh, about an imaged event horizon of a black hole that would give us a really powerful penetration of the quantum gravity era. But it demonstrates the principle. The more we learn about physics, the more we learn about the universe, the more evidence we see for the supernatural handiwork of God. Because what I point out in this book is that the measurements we have already uh, don't support the quantum eternity theorem that's being put out by atheist physicists but it's really consistent uh, with the theorem put out by Aaron Wall, where he says, if these quantum space-time fluctuations are small enough, then the space-time theorems hold all the way to t equals zero. And in a corollary to his theorem, he says, they might even hold that the quantum space-time fluctuations are big. But the measurements are indicating it doesn't look like they're big. But, and this is being uh, discussed in the scientific literature. Uh, you know, we've got atheists saying, well, maybe uh, we don't need uh, big quantum space-time fluctuations. But again, they're appealing to something we don't know and can't measure. And so what I share with audiences, everything we can know and measure and do experiments on tells us there really is a beginning to the universe. In the same manner that everything I know about my wife tells me she's real. But in that realm where I can't make measurements, <coughs> I could speculate as a physicist uh, that maybe I'm being fooled all these decades by a very sophisticated hologram. I mean, but all the measurable evidence tells me she's real and that she's not a hologram. Here's a text in question, Hugh. Okay. Do you see any similarities in the United States to any behavior, actions of a specific people or story recorded in the Bible? Yes. Uh, you'll see this in the book of Isaiah where it talks about the rebirth of the nation of Israel, uh, which depending how you interpret it happened in 1948 or 1967. Uh, but what it tells us in the book of Isaiah is that it would be silver and gold from people dwelling in the distant coastlands uh, that would play a key role in establishing this new nation of Israel. And um, there's actually historical evidence for this. In 1948, uh, when Israel was formed, they were being attacked by 10 Arab nations around them. They didn't have the military equipment uh, to hold back the attack. And so David Ben-Gurion sent a woman, Golda Meir, with $10 in her purse to New York. And she came back with $50 million. And those $50 million turned the tide in the Arab-Israeli war. And David Ben-Gurion, many years later, said, if it wasn't for the actions of a woman, there would be no new nation of Israel. But it was people dwelling in the distant coastlands that provided the gold and silver that made possible the rebirth of Israel. You'll find another reference in the book of Ezekiel, which is actually a reference to what will happen to people dwelling in the distant coastlands who live in safety. It's a reference to the future, which basically says uh, their security and safety uh, would be uh, disturbed. Uh, you'll read about it in uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 40, if you wanna uh, check it out. So, and the distant coastlands is a reference to big islands and big continents that are far away 
uh, from Israel, and I think that would include us, but you could also argue maybe it includes Australia, New Zealand, and South America as well. But uh, the point is, the gold and silver did come from the United States and Canada. And we are people living in relative safety and security. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I don't have much of a question, it's more of a comment. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, I came across another organization who tries to blend religion and science together. And they're telling me the earth is 7,000 years old because they followed the Abraham's genealogy. I had a seizure and I woke up three days later laughing hysterically because really? The earth is only seven? I'm glad that you're saying three billion years, four billion. That's great. But what concerns me a little bit is that I have this feeling, maybe I'm wrong, that we start that the Bible is 100% correct, and I'm taking Genesis literally, and then I'm making science prove it, where I think it should be different. It should be the science starting and perhaps moving towards the book of Genesis, which you probably know this, or the audience knows this. The Hebrew Bible has at least three ways. There's poetry, there's allegories, and there's some history there. But it's not all literally. When you mention Job, it feels that you, people believe that it literally happened. But for our tradition, it's, it, it's, a, it's a story. It has a tremendous theological implication, the story of Job, but Job was not a real person, flesh and blood. Okay? So my concern is when I see science or, uh, or religious institutions trying to make this fit into that, it concerns me a little bit. Because unfortunately, a lot of violence has been committed mm -hmm. to my people in the name of religion, or how we interpret religion. So when the interpretation gets strange, I step back and I say, oh God, help me. Because you know what I'm talking about. We can go yeah. back to the Inquisition, we can go back. So, but I'm glad at least, you know, I'm happy with the organization. I don't understand everything. I'm not a scientist. But anyway, thank you, it was just a comment. Well, it's an interesting comment. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with your statement that it's a mistake. Uh, to try to take uh, the Bible and uh, force uh, science into it. Um, but you know, that's not my story. Uh, my story is that uh, I was not raised in a Christian environment. In fact, I didn't get to meet Christians till I was, uh, to get to know them till I was 27 years of age. And uh, my quest began through astronomy, where I realized, okay, it looks like the Big Bang is a correct model uh, for the origin and history of the universe. And if that's the case, there's a beginning. If there's a beginning, there's a beginner. So I began to search for that beginner, first through the great philosophers, and discovered they had the wrong concepts of space and time. Then I began to look at the world's holy books. And what I was looking for were provable historical and scientific errors. I felt that this is a book that's communicated to us by the God of the universe, given what I see in the universe, it's a God that seems to really like consistency and harmony. Therefore, I said, the way to tell whether this is invented by humans or it's from the Creator is if it's invented by humans, there will be mistakes and errors and contradictions. So I look for those. And if you're looking at the Quran or the Hindu Vedas, it's not difficult to find several provable historical and scientific errors. But when I picked up the Bible, uh, over the course of 18 months, I was not able to find any provable scientific errors or uh, contradictions. Now, to be fair, I did find lots of texts that I didn't understand. But unlike what I saw in the Hindu Vedas or the Quran, I couldn't find uh, provable errors or contradictions. And I found many places where the Bible actually predicted future scientific discoveries. And I saw that in no other holy book, only the Bible, actually predicts uh, accurately future scientific discoveries. And as an astronomer, I was especially impressed that it predicted all the fundamentals of Big Bang cosmology, like the universe has a space-time beginning, that it expands from that beginning under laws of physics that don't change, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay, and therefore the Bible is implying that the universe must get colder and colder in a highly predictable way. And we astronomers actually have measurements of the past temperature of the universe 
how to confirm what the Bible declared thousands of years ago. Now, I would agree this can be overdone, and I've run into other Christians that basically read science into the text that I don't think is there. I mean, as a president of Reasons to Believe, I get manuscripts on my desk, unsolicited, from people who think that Genesis 1 and 2 uh, explains the particle creation model. So they're putting neutrinos in there, protons, and I'm saying, I don't see any of that in the text. And so one extreme is you're basically looking at almost every passage of the Bible as having scientific implications. But for example, I spoke at a seminary where seminary professors basically took the book of Job and said it says zero about science or creation. And it's like, you know, if you take this book as being an actual real account, I mean, it's got more science and creation content than any other book of the Bible. Uh, but their concern was if we read any science content in the Bible, we take a risk that it might not fit what we see in the established record of nature. On the other hand, if you, don't, if you have a zero risk theology, you also have a theology that's incapable of persuading anyone that this is the inspired uh, word of God. And so, you know, we were just talking about what the Bible says about the future nation of Israel. What if the Bible said nothing about future history? then we couldn't use history as a tool to persuade people this is actually beyond human capability. Likewise, if you strip all the science content of the Bible, you've got that problem. But for example, you can get a four views book, it's called Four Views on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. And one of the authors takes the position that the Bible has no science content at all. Uh, but you know, there's another position where you have extreme overlap our position is there is overlap, but we're not talking the majority of the text. It's part of the text, and it's the obvious parts, like Genesis 1, where it talks about this account of creation. You know, clearly it's talking about real things that God did to prepare uh, the planet for humanity. So I say, well, you can't deny the science content there. The, the question is, does it actually match what we scientists measure? And that was actually a big part of my coming to faith uh, in the Bible, was recognizing Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 correctly described everything and put it in the correct chronological sequence. Whereas when I looked at the uh, ancient Near Eastern creation stories, everything was out of order. And a lot of the stuff that was described wasn't even a correct description. So that was a major factor in turning my life from an atheistic worldview perspective to a theistic one and a Christian one. But yeah, good comment, and yeah, I'm frequently involved in debates with other believers where I think they've gone to one extreme or the other. And I think the best way to balance it out, we need to challenge one another. I mean, that's the benefit, for example, of having these luncheons that we have where we challenge one another and say, you know what, I think you went too far or I don't think you went far enough. We're gonna, whoa, wow. Is that making up for why it was quiet before? Um, we're going to do one more question before our break. Remember, if you want to get a chance to win a book, fill out that card. And if you would pass it, pass them that way. And if I could ask Bud and James on each side to go down and collect them, and we'll do a drawing. So you've got as long as it takes Hugh to answer this question to fill those out and get them there. Hugh? The Bible seems to suggest that the universe came from nothing. Lawrence Krauss seems to suggest this also. It's hard to imagine something coming from nothing without at least the laws of physics existing and being true, even if there was no matter, space, or time. Would this be a proof of God? Well, a long time ago, I gave a, a talk, Everything You Want to Know About Nothing. And was making the point after Lawrence Krauss published his book, A Universe from Nothing, that if you read his book, you can actually find nine different definitions of nothing in his book. And every one of his definitions is actually something. So it's common for physicists, for example, to talk about the universe being created out of a quantum space-time foam. Well, a quantum space-time foam is not nothing. Uh, we know from relativity and quantum mechanics and you can take quantum space-time foam and make particles out of it. 
Just like you can convert energy into matter and matter into energy, likewise you can convert space-time fluctuations into energy and matter. So uh, what Lawrence Krauss is talking about is not really the universe coming out of nothing. Now what you see in the Bible in Hebrews 11.3, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. So that's kind of a biblical definition of uh, nothing. And we can detect matter, we can detect energy, we can detect space, we can detect time. So the Bible's claim is that the universe that we can see and measure came from something by God's hand that's completely distinct from matter, energy, space, and time, the laws of physics, etc. So that's a big difference between what Lawrence Krauss is claiming than what the Bible has claimed for thousands of years. And the space-time theorems are consistent with what the Bible claims. They're not consistent with what Lawrence Krauss says, although I will give Lawrence Krauss some credit. On page 173 of his book, uh, he concedes that we can't take deism off the scientific table. And that's because of the force of these space-time theorems. And that's actually, I'd say, a correct label. Most physicists and astronomers that I've met that label themselves as atheists, when you press them, you discover that they're actually deists. They'll say things like uh, Stephen Hawking, I think the universe came from the law of gravity. Well, uh, he's basically making the point of deism, which is some agent brought the universe into existence, but that agent hasn't been doing a thing since he brought the universe into existence. It's basically the god of the 14 billion year nap model. <laughs> so, but theists believe that God not only acted at the beginning of the universe, he's acted since the universe, and he's acting in the lives of human beings today. So that's, that's the difference between theism and deism. But deism is very popular amongst my peers. Thank you, Hugh. Bud. James, bring those up. He's got them all. There's one, one more over there. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, James. We don't have a box or anything to put these in, Hugh, so we're just going to... Just put them on the table. You're just going to have to draw around. one. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I can... I know how to play cards. I can shuffle them. <laughs> All right. Pick a card, any card. First name's Tim. Last name is S-E-C-H-A-N-G, is that right? Come on up. Okay, so what we're, yeah. What we're giving away is either a DVD, Journey Towards Creation, or Hugh's latest book, Creator in the Cosmos, or the second latest book, Improbable Planet. And since you're, you drew first, you get your choice. Great, the latest and greatest. Congratulations. Okay, next one, Hugh. Margarita Cates. There you go. Right in front. No, you don't get to pray that you win. That's unfair. All right. Improbable point. <laughs> All right. Number three. Carl Yaki? Jackie? Yeah, very good. Yeah, congratulations, everybody. That's great. Okay, I think uh, the next question is, it's the microphone's turn. So, Doug, you're at it again. I also okay. want to say one thing. I understand we have some students here from Cal State Fullerton. So, welcome to you guys. Thank you for coming. Why don't you move over? Well, hold on a second. No, don't worry. Yeah. 
Hello. Can you Dan? Hear, can you hear me? Yep. Um, my question is regarding the um, miracles that Christ performed in the Bible, tell us. And uh, as a scientist, Dr. Russ, how would you explain what actually happened when Christ uh, takes fish and the bread and multiplies it at uh, 12,000, 7,000, and even have uh, leftovers. The Bible tells us there were 12 baskets left. So how, how would you, as a scientist, how would you explain what happened in your mind? Yeah, good question. And uh, you, you see in the Bible God performing three different kinds of miracles. Miracles that transcend the laws of physics, miracles that take place within the laws of physics, but demonstrate fine-tuned control, and then laws of simply sustaining the physics of the universe for the benefit of life on Earth. But what you see in the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, is that it focuses on the miracles that God performed that the prophets of the Old Testament could not perform, basically making the point that Jesus is more than just a prophet, and that he's actually the one that is God that created the universe. For example, when we look at the universe, the cosmic creation event, it's clearly an act by a being who can move and operate outside of matter, energy, space, and time. And so what you see recorded, for example, in the Gospel of John is repeated instances of Jesus performing miracles that are outside of what's possible within space, time, and uh, the laws of physics and matter and energy, like walking on water, or as you say, transforming a few uh, loaves and fishes into enough to feed 5,000 men and all their uh, families as well. And Sure. Well, I mean, for example, uh, there were Old Testament uh, scholars who were saying, well, a prophet can raise somebody from the dead, but a prophet can't raise anybody who's been dead for more than three days. And so with Lazarus, God waited till the fourth day before raising him, basically making the point that what you're seeing here is someone who's more than a prophet, is someone who actually has complete control uh, over the physics of uh, the universe. So this is what Jesus was trying to do, to establish that he was more than just a prophet. He was actually the one that uh, created the universe. So that's what's distinct about the Christian faith. I mean, for example, in uh, uh, the Islamic faith, they believe that Jesus was a prophet. You lost your picture. Well, that's okay. I don't okay. need to see the picture anymore. Um, but what we see in the New Testament and back, by the way, it also tells in the Old Testament that the Messiah would perform these kinds of miracles. So it's prophesied in the Old Testament that there would be one who would come who would perform these miracles, that one greater than Moses would come. Moses himself said that, someone greater than I will come. I think where Dan was headed with that, though, Hugh, is how did he actually do it? Did he create matter out of nothing? Did each fish appear as it went to the next guy? Or I mean, it's, I know it's speculative, but how would you think he might have done that? Well, just like you can't explain how a human being can walk on top of the Sea of Galilee, uh, or how that individual could also have Peter walk on the Sea of Galilee for a few seconds, um, you know, that can't be explained. Uh, within matter, energy, space, and time, and the laws of physics. So it's demonstrating, in fact, that's what the disciples' reaction was, you know, who is this individual? When they saw him walking on water, and when they saw him calm the storm, a storm that was threatening their lives, and with one word, Jesus transformed that uh, life-threatening storm into perfect calm, and the reaction is, who is this individual? Well, Jesus was simply making the point, I'm one who's greater than the laws of physics. And so, yeah, my answer to that is it was a miracle that God, he literally produced it, not from existing material. It was basically brand new stuff. So, Thank you. Thank you. Hugh, what caused that beach in Hawaii to keep the green sand? Okay, that sand will not stay green for much longer uh, because it's existing in an oxygen-rich environment. 
Um, and you know, the reason why we see green sand there, it came up from the deep interior uh, mantle of the earth. If it came up from the top mantle part, it wouldn't be green like that, which is why most lava flow eruptions, you don't see all of being a rich material. That, that's the one single incident where we do. Yeah, if you wait long enough. In fact, if you actually go to that beach, you'll see parts of the beach where the green stuff is actually starting to, to turn and look like regular sand. But yeah, there's uh, certain parts of it. In fact, that zoom in was actually looking at a, a part of the beach that's nothing but olivine crystals. I've been to that beach, so not all of it is olivine crystals, but you do find some parts that are. Thank you. Do we have another uh, person at the mic? You're on, Doug. Well, to use some uh, scientific terminology here, I'm tripping. <laughs> I'm tripping here because like um, right before the break, the question from the internet was about Lawrence Krauss and then nothing from something to nothing or nothing to something. And um, Al was just talking about miracles. He was right there when that, this happened and then he sat right next to me. So anyway, that's a comment. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead with my question anyway. Um, I don't really understand what Lawrence Krauss is saying, but I'd like to quote him here. Uh, the amazing thing is once you apply, in fact, quantum mechanics to gravity, as you were beginning to allude to in your last segment, um, <laughs> that's what it says right here, um, that, is po that is possible. Um, in fact, it is implied that space itself could be created where there was nothing before. That literally, literally whole universes could pop out of nothing by the laws of quantum mechanics. And the question is, why is there something rather than nothing? Be it becomes right because nothing is unstable and it will always produce something. And so that's what he said on this NPR broadcast in 2012. And so getting to the point here, um, one, could, one would have to infer a timeless quantum flux of information without energy or a vacuum uh, would need to occur to begin space-time. But still, this is an absolute nothing. In reality, an actual nothing is, nothing, is, is not only the absence of space-time and matter, but also the absence of quantum states. The Doug, laws gotta, of physics, I'm almost finished, and information. By definition, an actual nothing cannot produce something. The Big Bang is a miracle. William Legg Craig said, this skeptical response represents, I believe, a deliberate, deliberate abuse of science. The question is, do you agree? Okay. Well, if you go back to Romans chapter 1, it talks about people who reject God and that their responses, they attribute to the creation properties that only the creator possesses. And so this is an example of saying, well, okay, uh, the laws of quantum mechanics created the universe. Well, the laws of quantum mechanics don't have any power of creativity. They're simply descriptive of the universe. And so, yeah, you got Lawrence Krauss saying quantum mechanics did it. Uh, you had um, Stephen Hawking saying gravity did it. Uh, but what they're doing is they're actually attributing creative powers to gravity and quantum mechanics. It's an but equivocation policy, I think, yeah. All of our measurements tell us that's not the case. Uh, we see no creative capacity in the laws of physics. And, you know, we physicists have been measuring them for a long, long time. If indeed nothing is unstable, we would have seen some examples of that. We don't see any examples of that. And if nothing were truly unstable, we'd all be in real trouble because everything would be disturbed. So, you know, thank God that uh, nothing is not unstable because otherwise we'd have stuff popping into existence all over the place. But again, all of our observations are consistent with the fact that the laws of physics are descriptive. They don't possess powers within themselves. We have to look elsewhere to explain why the universe has a beginning. So but yeah, like don't be surprised that people, Jim, we see that in biology as well, uh, where people will attribute, say, to genetics, a uh, creative power that the genetics simply doesn't have. So a quantum, quantum vacuum is something, right? A quantum yeah. vacuum is something. Yeah. So. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, whenever a physicist says something came from nothing, ask him what kind of nothing are you talking about? Hugh, here's a question from a text. It's a very good question. How does the act of sacrifice clear up sin? How does the act of sacrifice clear up sin? Well, the Bible tells us that God is a holy God. He's not able to tolerate any evil or sin in his presence. And since we're all sinners and have all had the propensity to commit evil, the only way we can actually have fellowship uh, with God is if someone pays the penalty for our offenses. And this is what the creator of the universe did for us on the cross. He took upon himself uh, the penalty, uh, the holy penalty for all the offenses we committed against God and one another. And so what you have the creator of the universe doing is uh, paying a payment that none of us are able to pay on our own account. So and your analogies have been used as what have I got a debt of a trillion dollars? Given my salary, there's no way I can pay that debt off. But someone who actually has that kind of money can come forward and say, look, I'll take care of your debt for you. Well, likewise, the creator of the universe has come forward and has taken care of that debt for us. Uh, you know, a, a corollary I've gotten to that is how can a man dying on the cross for six to nine hours actually take upon himself the holy penalty of all the offenses committed by human beings. And I answer that question in the book, The Creator of the Beyond the Cosmos, by saying the one that died on the cross, in addition to being a human being, was the God that created the universe. It's a God that created the space-time dimensions of the universe, a God that's got the power, according to the space-time theorems, to create space-time dimensions at will. Who says that he only suffered for six to nine hours? That's in our time frame but in the time dimensionalities that he's able to experience, he could have easily accommodated a hundred billion infinitely long lines of time in which he suffered the penalty for all the offenses that we've committed against God and one another. And I think when we appreciate the depth of what happened in those six to nine hours, then who, as it says in Hebrews 2.3, who can turn down such a magnificent offer of redemption, if we really appreciate the depth of what was done on our behalf, who in the rational mind would turn down that offer? And that's an offer that God makes to every human being has ever lived. That, and that's something that Job recognized. He recognized, as you can see in the 17th chapter, he recognized he did not have the power to deliver himself from his propensity uh, for sin and evil but an all-powerful, all-loving God must have provided a way. So he says, I'm going to go to that God. So he was basically believing in what God would provide on his behalf. But we can look back in time and say, we don't have to look forward. It's already been done on our behalf. Al? Uh, I'm back. Uh, Uh, a, a few months back, the uh, so-called um, pastor of America died. I'm talking about, what's his name? Billy Graham. Billy Graham, no, Billy Graham. okay, yeah. Um, yeah, he was uh, my favorite televangelist. He said one time in one of his uh, uh, sermons that... Um, he knew what heaven was like, and he uh, he said it was 120 miles long by 120 miles wide, and that we would sit by a huge fireplace, and angels would wait on us, and we would go down those golden streets in a brand new Cadillac convertible. <laughs> that was uh, that was great. <laughs> How could you not love him? Anyhow, he was, uh, he was, uh, um, I looked him up in, I don't know, Google or something, had his little bio. He was, he's, when he died, he was worth $30 million. Well, you know, that's a, a little sum. That's not a great sum, but uh, it's sum. Uh, and uh, so I, I wondered, $30 million, hasn't he ever read the Bible? 
the Bible says, is, what is, is it more, you know, is it more, it is more difficult for a camel <laughs> to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Isn't yes. that right? It's Mar Matthew and, I don't know, Matthew and I had it written down. Matthew and Mark, I think. Matthew and Mark, oh, I got it right. So he didn't read the Bible very much, did he? But <laughs> what kind of a Christian was he? You well, know? So, you know, Al, I mean, this is, yeah, I guess good, good comment, it. but uh, there was a sermon given in this church uh, a few months ago uh, where the pastor explained uh, that very text, how it's difficult for a rich person uh, to enter heaven, as difficult as a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Now, it's not talking about a needle that you use to sew thread. It's actually a geological feature where you've got a small hole in a mountain. So he's making the point as difficult but not impossible. But what I loved about the sermon, he so went you, on to say, so here's, the what the Bible, here's what the <laughs> Bible defines as a rich person. So. A rich person is someone who's so wealthy, they know that they're going to eat the day after tomorrow. They've got enough wealth where they can not only have enough food for today and tomorrow, but even the next day. And oh. they're also wealthy enough that they actually have not one change of clothes, but two changes of clothes or more. And then he addressed all of us in the congregation. Okay, how many of you fit that description? Oh. Okay, well, the truth is we're all rich by that definition. Well, you can always, like, for, Al, Trump, let him for finish. Trump, probably, you could probably expand that needle. <laughs> for, for, you know, yeah, so but it's basic, but <laughs> Jesus is making the point is that, you know, most of us are in that category. In fact, even in the poor nations of the world today, yeah. most people are in that category. And we need to realize, don't let the wealth that you have uh, give you a sense of security where you think, I've got wealth and I don't need God. And so it's, that's what it means when it says it's difficult for a rich man uh, to enter into heaven because what happens when you've got wealth is you begin to think, I don't need anybody else's help. I don't need God's help. However, it says it's difficult, not impossible. What we need to do is realize, okay, the wealth I have is a gift from God. It can disappear at any time. I can't put my security in my wealth. I need to put my security in God, and I need to be generous with the wealth I have. What you see throughout the whole of the Bible is that God blesses people with wealth so that they can use that wealth to serve other people. So having wealth does not make you unrighteous. Um, However, it's what you do with the wealth that makes you unrighteous. I never could, I never, that's the reason I never got wealthy, because I read that a long time ago. Well, I can tell you, Al, <laughs> by the Bible's definition, you are a wealthy man. So, I'm, I'm and so poor. the so, challenge to you oh. is the same as the challenge to me. <laughs> by the Bible's definition, I'm wealthy. I'm very, what am I doing with the wealth that I have? I'm very poor, so I, I, I don't have to worry. I don't think there's a poor person in this whole room. <laughs> so we all have we, enough we, wealth that we know we're going to eat the day after that's tomorrow. Very, that's a very small hole. <laughs> in the needle. So, but the whole point is, what are you doing with the wealth that God has given you? Are you using it to serve others? Are you using it to serve God? Do you have the mindset, look, this is a gift from God. It can disappear any time. And if it does, that's okay. But good comment. Thanks. Hugh, here's a couple of questions that are kind of, that are, that are personal to you. And I think uh, I like that because we don't get those very often. What gets you excited regarding science coming up on the horizon? What gets me excited about science on the horizon? I'm really looking forward to our astronomy community uh, nailing down what kind of inflation was responsible shortly after the cosmic creation event. Because I anticipate that's going to give us a whole new set of fine-tuning evidence for the creator God of the Bible. Um, I could go on. There's lots of things I'm excited about. I think I'm excited about the fact that we're on the verge have actually seen the very firstborn stars in the universe. Uh, we've lacked the telescope power to actually image those stars, but we're really close. There are three telescopes that'll be coming online in the next five years 
that will have the power to actually image the very first stars. Now, we already have seen very lightly polluted uh, stars, stars that did form at the very beginning of the universe, but they're stars that are so old, they've been lightly polluted by the intergalactic uh, medium. But yeah, a time will come, uh, not soon from, not too far from now, we'll actually see stars 13.6 billion light years away, individual stars that were the very first stars that formed in the universe. Something else I'm looking forward to is astronomers or astronauts going back to the moon, digging up the Earth's soil that was transported to the moon and in that soil finding the fossils of Earth's first life and being able to prove who got the origin of life model right, the theists or the non-theists. And I think the Chinese are going to beat us to it. They're, they're interested in going back to the moon. And I'm hoping that they'll put that as part of their mission strategy. Because the problem with Apollo was it was aimed at finding pristine lunar rocks. I, I got to speak at NASA Houston a few years ago. I said, we need to go back to the moon with a different mission. Not to find the pristine lunar rocks, but to find the earth soil that's been dumped on the moon by meteoritic transport. And every ton of Earth's soil on the moon contains about 100 quadrillion uh, microbes. And we know that many of those microbes will be in the pristine form they were when they first appeared on Earth. We're never going to find the fossils of Earth's first life on the Earth. Earth's geology destroyed them, but they're in Earth's attic. If we go to Earth's attic, we're going to find them. So yeah, I'd be really excited about that. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for this talk. This has been really fun. Um, I apologize in advance to the crowd if this is a Bible 101 question, but I wanted to know if you could speak to um, more of the application process, if any, for submissions to the Bible. Um, I went to Catholic school, so I know a little bit about the disciples, how they might have had an in, but if you can just speak to, I mean, I know how to get myself into you know a journal there's abstracts there's a committee that reviews but um if you could just talk about the i guess the initial binding i, I know about the reproduction but how could a person get in were there any books that were rejected from the old and the new and sorry if that's not very science -y. yeah can you be a little more specific you want what what book are you talking about no, just the good book, the Bible. So when I say the Bible, I'm right. describing the combination of both the Old Testament right, and the right. New Testament. The one and, that... And Billion what's your question? Is, can you talk about the initial application process to be included oh. in that book oh, called well, I, the now Bible? Now I get it. Thank you. Yeah, what you're talking about is the formation of what's called the canon, you know, what, how did uh, you know, the Jews select the 39 books that make Correct. up the Old Testament? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, what about the 27 books that make up the New Testament? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank well, you. the Jews basically established some rules that were applied for both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Namely, that the content had to be consistent with the Ten Commandments. So, for example, Maccabees uh, 1 and 2, though they give a true account of the intertestamental period between the last of the Old Testament books and the first of the New Testament books, it's an accurate history, but there's a couple of passages that basically condone uh, murder as opposed to allowing the state to be the ones that has the authority. And so that's why those books are not included in the canon. They violated that principle. Another principle is, uh, does the book actually speak uh, from the authority of God himself, you know, like thus says God. So do we have that claim of authority? Uh, another aspect is, does the book actually make any predictions of future historical events and scientific, does it have predictive power? And so if it's stripped of all uh, predictive content, uh, that's not, uh, um, that's not considered a definitive evidence, but if that is there, uh, that adds to the weight of evidence for its conclusion. And of course, what it says about future history, geography, and science, is it 100% accurate in what it predicts? Because it was Moses that said, there will be many false prophets that will come. 
and here's how you know that they're a false prophet. When they predict some point of future history, geography, or science, if they're not 100% accurate in what they predict, don't believe them. They're a false prophet. And so the standard is it has to be 100%. Um, so there's actually good books you can get. The scholar F.F. F. Bruce has probably written uh, what I think is the best book on uh, basically answering your question, how did the canon get formed? I can tell you this, both Jews and Christians, uh, they spent literally centuries establishing what makes up the canon and what uh, causes a book to be rejected uh, from the canon. And so you know, another rule is it actually has to come from the claimed author. And so did Isaiah really write the book of Isaiah? And for example, there is a dispute 35 years ago where scholars took computer analysis of the book of Isaiah and they said, we think it was written by four different people. And so that caused some concern. Okay, what about, but everything that Isaiah says is loaded with predictive power. Lots of uh, prophecies of future history. And uh, it's passed the test. But what we now know is that the book of Isaiah was written by one person at four distinct times in his life, where there was like a decade between the first part that was written, the second part, a decade between the second part and the third part. And so Isaiah has been vindicated as being a legitimate book of the Old Testament. But yeah, F.F. F. Bruce has written a big thick book about you know how we got the Bible in the form that we got it. Thank you. Okay. Hang on, Steve. I've got a question of yours up here already, so we'll ask that now. Steve, you went to a different church and had a, heard what he thought was possible heretical teaching. How, does he, how can he know for sure if teaching is heretical? Well, I had that experience myself because I became a Christian through reading a Gideon Bible then tried to find a church. And uh, every church I tried in Canada, either nobody believed the Bible was the word of God, so I said, why bother going? And uh, the rest of the churches I tried were cults where they were teaching heretical uh, teachings. I think one way you can uh, discern whether or not a church is heretical, do they deny the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith? And uh, so, for example, the creeds. The creeds were basically formed as a way to challenge uh, the heretics in the church. And uh, you know, even the shortest of the creeds, the Apostle Creed, I think is adequate. I mean, every uh, cultic church I attended in some way violated what's in the Apostles' Creed. And so uh, I think that's one way to determine uh, whether uh, it's and for me, even though I didn't know any Christians, when I walked into a church, it was pretty easy for me to say, hey, this doesn't match what I read and understand uh, from the Bible. And typically what cults do is they'll overemphasize one doctrine of the Bible and deny the others. Uh, very common, for example, is to emphasize the love and mercy of God, but to deny the holiness of God and his capacity to judge a sin. And so the Bible teaches both. So any church that uh, you know, ignores one and promotes the other, that's a problem. Just a quick correction and then I have a question. The, the Hebrew Bible has 24 books. You mentioned 39, that's the Protestant Old Testament and the Catholic right. Old Testament is 46, right. just, just the numbers. But yep. my, my question is, could you compare your organization with the creationists movement? Ben Stein, he has this organization, and he wants to teach creationism in public schools, has created a lot of issues. That's question one. Number two, real quickly, does your organization believe the science proves that God is a trinity? Because yes. some organizations do. They point the science proves that God is three in one. I'm just curious. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, we were presented with the Ben Stein movie uh, about six weeks before it was released, and they wanted us to endorse it. And we basically said, we can't endorse the movie. Because it's basically making a point that uh, Christians uh, who are, you know, uh, believers in secular universities, they're being universally persecuted. And I said, well, yeah, I know some that are, 
but the majority are not. And so I thought the movie is making an overstatement. The persecution is not ubiquitous. You know, when I was at Caltech, everybody knew that I was a Christian uh, and I wasn't experiencing uh, persecution. And a whole lot of us at Caltech uh, who were believers. And so uh, we were more than tolerated. We were respected uh, for our uh, position. So, and also I felt that the Ben Stein movie was basically emphasizing one kind of creationism. Uh, you made reference to the young earth model and the vast majority of us who are Bible believing Christians do not hold to a young earth model. So uh, that's why we said we can't endorse the movie. Your question about the Trinity is interesting because uh, I had a couple of uh, Muslim apologists in my office a few months ago and they said, we know that you as a Christian believe in the Trinity, but you know, can you explain why you do? And I said, well, I came to that belief even before I picked up a Bible because to me, something like that is really the only way to explain how science operates. And so my critique of Islam, for example, is they do not have an answer for the origin of love because they believe that God is one and only one person. Well, by definition, love requires at least two individuals to receive love and express love. And, uh, but I'm not comfortable with uh, Hinduism because they have all these gods that participate in creation and they all got different plans and uh, so, you know, as I engage people of a Hindu worldview perspective, they have this uh, belief that creation is going to be filled with inconsistencies and contradictions because of how many personal gods are involved. They all got different plans. But kind of the heart of the Christian faith is that there are these three persons, but they have one essence. They got one mind, one purpose, one plan. And we see in nature is complete consistency and harmony. It's not multiple people with multiple designs and multiple uh, creation objectives. There's a single objective, a single mind, a single purpose. Uh, but you actually have God experiencing love and giving love before he creates anything. So my problem with Islam is, I mean, kind of the, uh, the mantra in Islam is nothing is greater than God but their own theology makes us human beings greater than God because we come from a being that had no capacity for love and yet we have a capacity for love. Or to put it another way, in Islam, God must create in order to experience love. But in Christianity, God's not compelled to create. It's something that he does by his own free will uh, because he's already experiencing the fullness of love before he creates anything. Matter of fact, there are passages in the Old and New Testament that make the point that God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything. So creation is not his top uh, priority. Now, people have asked me, okay, I can understand that, but why three? Why not just two? And I says, well, notice in human psychology, where you got two, you get codependent love. But bringing a third individual, it breaks that codependency. So. That at least roughly explains uh, why only with a Trinitarian kind of God you can have compatibility uh, between uh, what the Bible teaches and what we see in nature. Science only makes sense uh, from a triune uh, divine uh, perspective. So I'd argue science doesn't make sense if there is no God, there's got to be a God, but it's got to be this particular kind of God. And Actually, if you're interested, right now in the class I'm teaching, we're going through the book of Isaiah. And it's the book of Isaiah that most explicitly teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, it does. It repeatedly says God is one, but it names three persons who all take deity, even take the name of Yahweh. And so, for example, in Jeremiah, uh, the name of the Messiah is called Yahweh. So you've got two individuals taking the single name or as it says in Genesis 1, uh, you have Elohim, uh, the uni-plural one, and you've got on the creation of human beings, uh, God using the singular pronoun and the plural pronoun. So God is referred to as a singular uh, pronoun, but also referred to with a plural pronoun. So it's a God that is simultaneously singular and plural. 
And that's basically the doctrine of the Trinity, how God is one in essence, but three in personality. Thank you, Hugh. How did God, excuse me, how did Noah build the ark big enough to accommodate all the animals? Well, he didn't build an ark to accommodate all the animals on the face of the earth. Uh, what God told him is, take a pair of every basar on board the ark, which is a reference to the soulish animals uh, that are in relationship with human beings. And so we're not talking millions of species of animal life. I don't think God was telling me to take cockroaches on board the ark. There might have been a couple that were there anyway. Uh, <laughs> they seem to be everywhere. So, uh, but no, it was the soulish animals. And there's a reason for that. If you look at the book of Leviticus, it makes the point that these are animals that God designed to serve and please human beings. Uh, but if an animal is in a, in a bonded relationship with a human being, where that human being has a very vicious character, then that animal will behave in a vicious way. In fact, in the book of Leviticus, it talks about how if a man has a cow that's in the habit of goring other animals and people, that man is to be rebuked. And if the cow continues in that behavior, the cow is to be destroyed and the owner along with it making the point that it's the owner that's responsible uh, for that behavior. And it's not that the cow was evil or sinful. The cow simply is designed to please its human owner. And if what brings pleasure to the human owner is vicious behavior, that's how the animal be be will behave. So I think that explains the vicious dog syndrome. Uh, vicious dog are not owned by compassionate, kind people. So, um, I don't know if any of you got a vicious dog, so I'm not trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we had a dog that had a problem, but when we found out it was uh, his previous owner had basically trained the dog to be really vicious. So that's a problem. Yes. Um, no, I mean, uh, the Bible does tell us that wild cows are very difficult to tame. But once cows are tamed, uh, they will be uh, in a, an emotional relationship with you. I mean, I had an uncle that raised cows, uh, but he, traded, he treated his cows with such kindness that the cows would run towards the fence to greet him every time he came by in his pickup truck. They really loved my uncle. Uh, but it's because he treated them with uh, such a kindness and the Bible actually exhorts us to do that, that uh, you know, God has given us these animals, but we're to treat them uh, with kindness. And they will produce better for you. That was my uncle's claim. If you treat your cows with kindness, the milk is better and the meat is better. So. Well, it's basically back to this flood question. The reason why God said take two of every nephesh creature uh, that has a relationship or association with human beings, those are the only animals that can be damaged by human evil and sin. You can sin all you want in front of a mosquito. It's not going to change the behavior of the mosquito. Uh, it, does, it doesn't have the capacity to bond to you emotionally. It'll bond to you in other ways, but not emotionally. So, uh, but dogs and cats and cows and horses are different. Uh, it tells us in Genesis 1, they're not just physical, they're also soulish. God endows them with mind, will, and emotions and gives them the capacity uh, to relate to a higher being and to serve and please that higher being in the same way God designed us to serve and please a higher being and uh, to relate to him uh, in an emotional relationship. But it's because of that that the evil people in the days of Noah had so mistreated their animals that God said they have to be destroyed, just like that cow is in the habit of goring other animals. If the behavior can't be turned around, the cow needs to be destroyed. However, there would have been animals that Noah is in relationship that weren't damaged by human sin. He says, take two of each of those. However, 
The Bible is explicit that the flood of Noah destroyed the entire world of ungodly people, but it doesn't say it destroyed the whole planet. It's the world of the ungodly that was wiped out, not the whole planet. In fact, Psalm 104 is explicit about that. It talks about creation day three, when continents for the first time appear. That's verses uh, seven and eight. Verse nine says, now that the continents are here, never again will water cover the whole face of the earth. That statement's repeat, repeated four more times in Job and Psalms and Proverbs. And uh, therefore, the flood of Noah did not inundate the whole world. Therefore, there was no need for Noah to take a pair of polar bears on board the ark or a pair of emperor penguins on board the ark because that, did not, that was not the world of the ungodly. Ungodly people had not yet visited the Arctic or the Antarctic. And therefore, uh, the ark was more than big enough to accommodate all the soulish animals that were in relationship with human beings and big enough to carry two years' supply of food and water in addition to all those animals. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Okay. And I've got like 12 questions on the phone that I'm not going to be able to a answer, so please don't send in any more. <laughs> but we'll take, I think, probably one more from the mic and maybe one or two more from text. So go ahead, sir. I have a friend that talks about a parallel universe. Can you explain where the, what the, the issues are here when I hear that? Yeah, I missed the first word. You had a friend that talks about what kind of universe? Parallel universe. Oh, parallel universe. Okay. Yeah, that's the parallel universe idea, also referred to as the multiverse, uh, making the point that uh, it's possible there are other universes. It was Einstein who said, once you've got observers in universe A, those observers can never detect the possible existence of a second universe. But it also means we can't rule out the possible existence of a second universe, or for that matter, 10 universes, or for that matter, an infinite number of universes. So a number of non-theistic physicists have speculated, maybe the universe isn't fine-tuned for our existence. Maybe instead, there's an infinite number of universes uh, where every universe is different from the other universe, and therefore all this fine-tuning that we measure, it's here by pure chance. And so God didn't design the universe, the multiverse did. Um, but it has serious philosophical uh, weaknesses. One being is that it explains away all design, not just God's design. So in this book, The Crater and the Cosmos, I tell a little story if you've got an infinite number of universes where they're all different from the other universe, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch trees uh, in that multiverse. And you're going to get one species of birch trees that will peel white pieces of bark. All birch trees do. But this is a birch tree that peels pieces of bark that are 8.5 by 11 inches. And they fall on soil that's got chemicals in it that make random markings on these eight and a half and 11 pieces of white birch uh, bark. And uh, those markings in an infinite number of universes will duplicate all the equations, letters, and paragraphs, and tables, and charts that you see in every research paper published by every physicist who ever lived. And so those research papers didn't come from the minds of those physicists, the multiverse did it. You're basically exposing a philosophical inconsistency. You're appealing to an unknowable infinite infinity to explain away God's design, but it explains away all design. But I also argue in this book, there is a way to test the atheistic version of the multiverse. And that is, if this really does explain away all the fine tuning design, at some point as we continue to make measurements in the universe, we're gonna see that the evidence for fine tuning design for a specific benefit, instead of increasing with respect to time, will plateau and drop. And so we've been making those measurements for centuries now, and it's always gone up. Matter of fact, it's going up exponentially. It's going up at such a rapid rate that every month, the evidence for fine-tuning design for the benefit of us human beings rises by about a factor of a 1,000 times. 
which is why when I speak on university campuses, I tell the skeptics, if you're not persuaded today, wait one month. But if the atheistic version of the multiverse is correct, we would not be anticipating this exponential increase in fine-tuning design. At some point, it's going to plateau and drop. The fact that it's never plateaued and dropped, that it's consistently gone up exponentially, tells us that indeed there is a mind behind the universe with supernatural powers that designed the universe for our specific benefit. And I think especially compelling when you say, what kind of design do you need to have a planet somewhere in the universe that can support at one time seven billion human beings? There you really see the fine-tuning design rise at a very steep exponential level. Hugh, another question, a personal question. What would be your biggest dream for reasons to believe before you retire? My biggest dream for reasons to believe before I retire is that we would raise up a community of at least 300 scientists and other scholars uh, who would uh, take the message that, hey, we're seeing increasing evidence from the frontiers of knowledge that there's a God behind the universe who personally designed the universe for our benefit and also is able to deliver us uh, from the sin and evil that we all are, are plagued with. The idea that uh, there's a God out there who desires to redeem us and have a personal relationship with us for the rest of eternity. We're well on our way to doing that. Right now, the scholar team we have numbers around 50 individuals, but we're hoping to build it up uh, to uh, 300. And as I tell all the scientists on staff at Reasons to Believe, your job is to find not just one person, but several people to replace what you're doing. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to being replaced. <laughs> well, <laughs> notice that uh, when I'm traveling away from uh, this area, we have a half dozen people in the class that do a really excellent job of teaching in my place, including this gentleman behind me and that gentleman in the back of the class over there. So yeah, we're really blessed with some great people. And that's part of what we've been doing over the past 30 years, is raising up people who can step in. In fact, I argue that's a biblical principle. Uh, we're all to raise up people uh, to be disciples uh, of our, our Savior. And uh, our job is not just to bring them uh, to faith, uh, but to bring them to a point where they can instill faith in other people. I'm going to close with one more, one more question. We've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to break the flow here and finish with a, uh, another Internet question. Um, it looks like we're at the end of human history when the temperature goes up three degrees. What do you see, foresee for humans today? Well, if you look at the Ice Age cycle that we've been experiencing for the past 2.6 million years, every time the global mean temperature has gone up two degrees centigrade, above where it is right now, uh, our planet plummets into an ice age. And uh, there's several models that explain why that happens. The one I think that has the best explanation is that when the global mean temperature rises, you wind up melting the polar ice cap. When you melt the polar ice cap, sunlight now evaporates more water off the Arctic Ocean and a lot of that water falls as snow on Siberia and Canada. And you say, well, what's the problem? If you warm up Canada, doesn't that help? Well, the problem is, I, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada, and I can tell you that uh, if you go up at a certain latitude, uh, you get 10 and a half months of winter, uh, two weeks of black flies, two weeks of mosquitoes, and two weeks of horse flies. So they really do have four seasons. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, during those uh, ten and a half months, the temperature is well below freezing, and so simply raising the uh, temperature of Canada from 50 below zero to 40 below zero is not going to stop the snow. And if you've got more snow falling in Canada and Siberia, you've got an ice age, because that snow will accumulate. And that's what's happened in all the previous ice ages. The reason there's not ice over all of Canada today is that the average precipitation over Canada is only 10 inches a year. That's not enough precipitation 
to allow ice to accumulate in spite of how cold it is up there. But hey, if you evaporate more water off the Arctic Ocean, which is what will happen when you melt all the ice, then that precipitation level goes up to 20 inches a year. And that will bring on an ice age. And explains why, when you look at the past ice age cycles, as soon as that temperature peaks up, you get a rapid drop into an ice age. And the ice age lasts like 90 to 100,000 years. Now what's interesting is when you are in an ice age, uh, the temperature jumps up and down by about 24 degrees Fahrenheit. But explains why, what I mentioned before, we have evidence that humans living during the last ice age were engaged in sophisticated agricultural activity. But it was all done on a very small scale because of how dramatically the global mean temperature was jumping up and down. And it's the story I tell in an improbable planet. Over the past 2.6 million years, that's been the norm for the climate stability, jumping up and down by 24 degrees Fahrenheit on time scales of two or three centuries. The only time in the past 2.6 million years where we've had a stable climate is the last 9,000 years. Never before have we had an ice age cycle with a stable temperature. But that's what we've got now, and that's why you can have billions of people on the face of the earth today. And yeah, and you can't have humans without an ice age cycle. We need an ice age cycle to be able to grow the food that we need, to launch the technology that we need uh, for civilization. So yeah, removing the ice age doesn't help. And never before in the history of the earth has there been an ice age cycle, only the last 2.6 million years. And only once has there been the temperature stability to permit a large human population. We're in it right now, but yeah, it will end. Eventually, we're going to see another ice age come. So the question is, how much time do we have? Uh, it could happen in as little as 100 years. It could take as much as 1,400 years. So it's all up to us whether it happens in 100 years or 1,400 years. Well, thank you, Hugh. We're out of time. I want to remind you all that there's a book table over here. And tomorrow night, we're doing this again for another two hours at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. And for all of you who are capable, we would ask if you could help us stack these chairs up over there. Before we give Hugh a round of applause, before, I'd like to ask you, Hugh, to close us in prayer. Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you that you're a God that enjoys us coming to you with questions. We thank you for the example of King David, a man after your own heart, who just kept plaguing you with questions. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God that answers our questions. Help us, Lord, to be diligent in seeking those answers. Help us, Lord, to recognize the benefit of the hard work to get those answers. But thank you, Lord, that you're a God that made us curious. You're a God that made us want to seek after answers. And Father, I pray as we seek, we would find you, discover you, and enter into an eternal relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you.